Okay. So let's begin by starting off with the opening prayers, the altruistic motivation. So we we'll recite where it's indicated twice in English and once in Tibet. All mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Dagla dangwa je pe dra no pa je pe ge. Dar pa dang tam she ken pe pa du jo pa je pa tam she ki so je pe. Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang den. Dug now dang drow nor do la na me pa yang dag pa zog pe zang ju bun po she to pa ja. Next is the action bodhicitta prayer. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Tibet. De she du sang ma ge gi ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Ma she ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Du de ring ne song te ni ma sang ta sam gi ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. The Long Refuge Prayer. We take refuge in the kind root lama and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble dakas, dakinis, and dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root lama and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Transanzawadangurpajepepadanlamadampanamlakapsuchiyo Pape ge du nam la kab su chi o. Pa wo ka jo jo kyong song be song ye she gi chang dang dem pa nam la kab su chi o. Taking the Bodhisattva vow. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas, as the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path. I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas, as the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. 
Chang Ju Ming Por Chi Ki Ba Sang Nam La Kab Su Chi Cho Dang Chang Shu Sam Pa Yi So Klang De Shin Kab Su Chi Zhitar Nong Di De She Ki Chang Shu Tug Ni Ki Pa Dang Shang Shu Sam Pe La Pa La De Da Grim Shin A Pa Pa De Shin Dro La Pen Dan Du Shang Shu Sam Ni Ki Gi Shin De Shin Du Ni La Pa La Rim Pa Shin Du La Pa Ji In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye cho dang so ki cho nam la Shang ju ba du dagni kab su chi Dagi jin so ki pe so nam gi Cho la pen chi sangye ju pa sho The four thought, the four immeasurables. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang de we go dang dem pa jur chi. Dog now, dang, do now, gi, you, dang, draw, why, George. Dog now, may pay, they, wa, dang, me, draw, why, George. May ring, chak, dang, ni, dang, draw, way, tang, nam, la, ne, pa, George. Okay, thank you very much. So take a deep breath, fill your lungs with fresh, clean, pure air. Pour the air through both your nostrils, expand your, your abdomen, which opens up your diaphragm, which pulls the air into your lungs. We hold that fresh, clean, pure air in our body, in our lungs. We pull our shoulders back and our two hands come right to four inches below our navel. And then we exhale, squeezing the abdomen, pushing against the diaphragm, pushing out all the stale, not negative, dark air out of our lungs. Through our two nostrils, and we hold that vacant breath. Keep your back straight. Breathe in again. Both nostrils, fill your lungs, expand the diaphragm, the belly, hold the breath. Exhale. Stale, negative, dark air going out through both nostrils. Hold the vacant breath. Watch your back, keep it straight. Breathe in again, both nostrils. Hold it.
exhale. Hold it. Breathe in. Exhale. Breathe in. Exhale. Breathe in one last time very deeply. Exhale very completely. Okay, relax, breathe normal, open your eyes. Okay. So whenever we're doing practice, whenever we're receiving teachings, whenever we're studying, there's three questions we should always be asking ourselves. What is it that I am doing? Why am I doing it? And how do I do it? Are the three questions that we always should be asking ourselves to keep our mindfulness. What we are practicing is the Dharma, the Dharma teachings the Dharma practices, that's the what, the liberation, is the why we are doing this, to liberate ourselves from our suffering, from our confusion. And how we do it is through the, the Dharma teachings that we receive, the stages of meditation the studies that we've been going through, the instructions that we've been receiving and so on, is the how that we do this through discipline. So there's more to each one of those three questions, to the answers of those three questions, but primarily we should be thinking about those three, especially the why is the most important question. Why do we do this? Because it's very easy for us to lose our motivation in the routine of doing things over and over again. We sometimes lose sight of why we are doing this. So it's always important to recall that. Okay. So this is the last chapter in the book, Stages of Meditation, written by Kempo Samduk, which is a very, very excellent book. It goes through these stages. So uh, it should be followed very literally um, to establish a routine. And then we can kind of, it becomes automatic for us. We, we kind of make it suit our own selves, our own lifestyle, the times of day that we can do this and so on. But the elements that are within the stages of meditation are giving us purpose for what it is that we're doing that we look at the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. We look at developing loving kindness for all beings. We look at having compassion for all beings who are suffering. We look at bodhicitta, the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the four immeasurable qualities that all the enlightened ones have that we want to be able to be the perfect embodiment of ourselves. We already have those within ourselves, but we need to learn to remove the blockages so that that bodhicitta is always coming forth. And then we learn how to do calm abiding meditation, shamatha meditation. And then as we get to stabilize our calm abiding meditation, 
then wisdom thoughts begin to come up. Insight thoughts begin to come up. And we need to be able to know how to um, work with those thoughts and be able to explore those thoughts. So the, that's called the Vipassana meditation, the insight meditation. So we learn that in stages of meditation. And then we learn about the generation stage of developing our awareness of becoming the, the Buddha, becoming the, the deity with, that is within ourselves and recognizing that. We recognize the environment as the Buddha field, as, as the palace of the Buddha. We recognize the seat of the Buddha and what that represents. And then we begin to, then we recognize the, the physical visualization of the Buddha. And then we come to where we become the Buddha, where we chant the Buddha's names and we become the Buddha, we recognize the Buddha, we're like invoking the Buddha within ourselves. And then we have the completion stage where now we become, we go into the Mahamudra, we go into the, to the, um, to the enlightened mind, where we have glimpses of that peace, of that liberation, of that enlightened mind. So this is the subject for tonight, chapter eight, the completion stage of having that moment of clarity, having that moment of bliss, having that moment of, of, of being able to be everywhere all at once and nowhere at all. And no time, time just goes away. So this is something that needs to be experienced. This is something that we can point in the direction of how to, how to get yourself to this point, but it's up to you to be able to make the commitment to put the time into all these other stages to be able to make ourselves a proper vessel to be able to recognize, to be able to realize, to be able to become the embodiment of the completion stage of this liberation. So this is what we're working for. And this takes many, many lifetimes. It's taken you many, many lifetimes to get to where we are right now. And there's more lifetimes ahead of us. We're, and we do this one little piece at a time. So we have to have patience, we have to have diligence, we have to have a method. And this is all what we're learning is this method. So we turn to the, to the notes here in chapter eight. And um, I think we may be able to finish this tonight. It's not real long. So it says, <clears throat> in the completion stage when resting the mind and completely relaxing the mind in its natural state, there is this vivid, open, clear awareness. So we need to look directly at the essence of the mind. What is it like? Really look into the nature of your own mind and see for yourself. So in the past week, we looked at ourselves as becoming a, our true self, not the self that we look in the mirror and we see, but something that is deep within ourselves that is our life force that has been with us since the moment we were conceived, we have during our entire lives, and when we, when we drop our body, we eject this life force into the bardo, into reality, as we would say. This is one side of reality. So we've been looking at what this true self is. And we look at this true self through the examples of the Buddhas, of the, the Yidams, of the, um, of the deities. So this is what we've been talking about. And this is part of what makes um, Vajrayana, this type of Buddhism, uh, special. It is different than the other types. This is like the part now is the wisdom part of actually becoming an enlightened being, of becoming a Buddha. So we've, we've been talking about how to do this, and now we have a window, we have a way to be able to see our mind in this way. So now once you become conversant in this practice, and you have a conviction. There is the sense of mind as being this vivid presence, but without anything to pinpoint or identify. There is just this clear, vivid, open awareness 
that is present and aware. Yet there is no possible way to articulate, conceptualize, or define it as being this or like that. So it's something that is beyond our comprehension as a human being. It is something beyond our expression as a human being. But we can experience it. And to do that, we need to transcend our human nature. So this is what all this process has been, is to be able to identify what our human nature is, how it is that we have this human nature, and then how it is that we can transcend this human nature into our true nature, this Buddha nature, what we call the Buddha nature. So it's non-conceptual. So we can't define it as this or that. It's something beyond. It's something that needs to be experienced. So it is just knowing, clear and unceasing, vivid, present, nakedly aware. It is like you are seeing something you never saw before. You are experiencing something, something you never experienced before. You know it. You believe it. You are sure, but you cannot put it into words. This is what is known as the completion stage. So an analogy for this that Garchin Rinpoche uses all the time, it's like a child running to its mother and falling into her lap and being embraced by your mother. And having this experience is like, oh, it was there the whole time. It's like taking water, a pitcher of water, and pouring water into water. It was there the whole time. It hasn't changed. So there's many analogies. There's many metaphors that we can use for this experience. But none really encapsulates it. One never really articulate, articulates it. It is an experience that everyone must have for themselves. No one can give you enlightenment. No one can give you this completion. You have to experience it for yourself. This awareness, this present knowing, this clear, open, unborn, unstatic, unceasing, vivid presence is also what is known as Mahamudra or Dharmakaya. So the Mahamudra is a name that we use as a, a Sanskrit name. It means the great vehicle, the great position, the great seal, the great commitment. The Mahamudra, this is what, what becomes solidifies that becomes solidifies is the wrong word it becomes stable as as something that is beyond our human nature but we are part of it and we it stays with us once we have a glimpse of this it never leaves us we may put it aside we may kind of suppress it through our other confusions and and complications that we make in our everyday life. But we can rediscover that time over and over and over again by going through the process of the stages of meditation. And it's always there, we can bring it up. And the more that we do it, the more stable that we, it becomes with us so that we don't lose it. It's not suppressed, it stays with us. And even when we do things that are non-virtuous, even when we do things that are creating uh, suffering in our minds, confusion in our minds, or for other, we still recognize, oh, that is really not the real true nature. I know what I've done, and I, 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 I need to forgive that. I need to let that go. We're going to learn exactly how to do that in a couple of weeks. But there is a process to be able to do that. In the, but in the meantime, we have this this awareness, this stability, this, this um, Mahamudra that never leaves us. So we also call this the Dharmakaya. This is the truth body. This is the mind of the Buddha. When our mind, we talk about our mind, our little mind, our intellectual mind, becomes the big mind, the heart mind of the Buddha. So here we have heart thoughts. Here we have brain thoughts. 
and there are two different things, although they are part of what we need to be able to recognize. It's the brain thoughts that block our being able to recognize and realize the heart thoughts. When we can let go of all those brain thoughts, the heart thoughts just come pouring out. So this is what we're trying to recognize. This is the completion stage. This is the Dharmakaya, the truth body. This is also the ultimate true three jewels of refuge, the true meaning or essence of the mantra, mandala, and so forth. Right there in that moment of knowing, the three kayas are encompassed. The basic nature that cannot be pinpointed or fixed anywhere at all is the Dharmakaya. The natural radiance that is never ceasing is the Sambhogakaya. These two kayas, non-dual, non-fixed, are Nirmanakaya. So these three kayas, the Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Nirmanakaya, we've talked about in the past. We'll talk about a lot more as we move forward. But one, the Dharmakaya is the truth body, the Sambhogakaya is the subtle enjoyment body of the intellect, of being able to learn to recognize the symbols, recognize the signs, recognize the characteristics of the way that the truth body manifests for our benefit. It's all part of the Buddha. So these are the appearances of the Buddha. The Sambhogakaya is all the deity. And then is the Nirmanakaya. The Nirmanakaya is the emanation body of the truth body of the Buddha, of the mind of the Buddha. Because sometimes we need to have a teacher who we can hear, who we can see, who we can touch, who we can smell, we can recognize with our, with our senses as a, as a being, and to be able to hear the subtleties of the Sambhogogaya and of the unexpressiveness of the Dharmakaya, but to be able to give us permission to be able to make the commitments that we need to do to be able to have those experiences, to have the permission to be able to do that. It's very important because we rationalize how we don't want to do this. We give ourselves permission to push this away, to rationalize, to be lazy, to get busy doing many other things and so on. So now we have to be able to give ourselves permission to put those things aside and be able to commit to our spirituality, to be able to commit to the Dharmakaya, to our truth body. So the Nirmanakaya, the emanation body of the Buddha, helps to facilitate that. So the Buddha Shakyamuni was a Nirmanakaya essence, was a Nirmanakaya presence, I should say. He, ha he was a human being. Uh, Garchin Rinpoche is a living Buddha. He is here to be able to give us permission, to be able to show us a way and see that this does work, this does manifest. This is living in his body. And he's here to teach us a way to do it. And many, many, many of our other teachers are Nirmanakaya teachers, either in the past, or right now, or to come in the future. And that we become Nirmanakaya. We become Sambhogakaya. We become, excuse me, we become Dharmakaya. It's all within, pardon me, it's all within our midst. We can do that. It's just being able to know how to commit to doing the, the method to be able to attain this realization and this stability. This is part of the completion stage. This very mind of yours, this continuum, this original primordial knowing, innately aware, vividly clear and present, is emptiness and compassion, inseparable, the inseparability of the two truths, the inseparability of skillful means and wisdom, the inseparability of the development and completion stages. It is only a matter of relaxing the mind in its natural state 
and not deviating from that nature of emptiness, clarity, emptiness, awareness. So what this is saying is all the dualities that are part of the human condition, part of our human nature is to see things in terms of dualities. It's good, it's bad, it's black and white, it's up and down. Myriads and myriads and myriads of these, these permutations of dualism, our dualistic nature. And the, the most basic of that is our breathing, our breathing in and our breathing out. This dualistic nature permeates everything that we see, everything that we know, everything we hear. Our breathing is, is symbolic, is representative of that coming in, going out, of that dualism. And it's not until we stop breathing, when we give up our body, when our outer breath stops, that we release the inner breath this oneness, for lack of a better word, this non-conceptuality, this true nature is then ejected. So all this very mind, this continuum, this tantra, continuum means tantra, tantra means continuum. This is continuum, this going along all this dualistic nature. So we've been looking at this, we've been talking about this as we go through the philosophy of learning Buddhism and the practice of the stages of meditation. So we've been talking about this. So now it's all coming to the point of being able to be released, of the completion of letting all of that go. This is the nature of emptiness clarity and emptiness awareness. Understanding the duality, the duality, and letting it go into the absolute. There is nothing else to meditate on, no meditation outside of and apart from this. During the four daily activities, the four daily activities are eating, sleeping, moving around, and using the restroom. Those are called the four daily activities that we can escape from. As long as we're breathing, as long as we're living, we're doing these things. So to maintain your awareness without wavering, Within that state, whatever thoughts or emotions arise, simply recognize them. By doing so, you will naturally be cleared like snowflakes falling into a lake. So through the tools that we've learned of recognizing the five poisons and the antidote for the five poisons and recognizing the six perfections and recognizing the four noble truths and the eightfold path of all these little techniques, all these little intellectual things that we have created for ourselves or that we have accepted as part of the teachings of the Buddha to be able to identify what all this is, then we're able to, we're able to release it. We're able to use it for what we are doing here, but at the same time to realize that that is only one small part of our true being, of our true nature, of our true nature. Being a human being is just a very, very small part of our true nature. So when we have glimpses of that true nature, we begin to recognize that, we begin to realize that. And then we want to have more experience, we want to have more glimpses and make those glimpses become visions. And then those visions become stability in our lives. So by sustaining this over a long period of time, eventually you will experience being naturally in the state without having to place your mind there. Then, even in the four daily activities, you will be in a state of ever-increasing naked awareness of clarity and emptiness, non-dual. So you just become natural. You become a natural Buddha, a natural awakened one. That's our natural state. That's the natural mind. As human beings, we have cluttered that up. We have blocked that up. We have made that confusing. We have fostered the ego. 
we have fostered our personas all this all this fabrication that we have created out of the uh, five uh, poisons which constitute the 84,000 emotions that we relish in that this is our justification our emotional we say oh being emotional is a wonderful thing because we can identify with those things but for us to be able to let those go is to become free is to become the buddha to become awakened and so on so it doesn't mean that we stop enjoying we enjoy now in a much more enriched manner we see things as they really are and we can enjoy things much greater much more and we can help other beings to enjoy much more we can help them through compassion when they are suffering we can help them through our loving kindness and we recognize all things as being the same all things as being equal and this is a great liberation this is the naked awareness being able to see all this naked awareness it's not colored in any way it's not shaped in any way it is completely free it is completely natural To introduce thoughts as Dharmakaya, when mind is let go, relaxing in its natural state, look directly into the essence of mind itself, this open, vivid, present awareness, clear and without thoughts. So we go into this unfabricated completion stage where thoughts stop for a time. And the more adept we become at this, the more we can stabilize that Mahamudra. And we can see a thought coming. And we see the thought, and we can let the thought go, and it just goes without stopping. Sometimes that thought will come in, and we kind of hesitate a little bit. And that thought is there, and we might chase that thought a little bit. But then if we're trained properly, if we have the conviction of our training then we know how to let that thought go and maybe we need to be able to go back a little bit and use a little bit more of our training to get to that point of no thought to get to that pure meditation point but we know the way there we've done it over and over again now so we can see these thoughts coming we can see the thoughts go we just let them go we don't pay attention to as you are resting in this nature whatever thoughts surface look directly into the essence of the thoughts meditate as before and gain conviction these very thoughts that are increasing that, excuse me these very thoughts that are unceasing are nakedly present clarity emptiness so these thoughts the brain's function is to think our heart's function is to keep pumping blood our kidneys function is to be filtering. Our liver is to keep filtering and so on. So all these different organs within our body have a distinct function. And the brain's function is to think. It's perfectly natural for it to do it. So we're not going to completely stop those thoughts. For a time, we can. But what we can do over and over again and stabilize is not paying attention to those thoughts letting those thoughts just go through as being mundane dualistic thoughts that have no purpose in our meditation in our true nature consider for example the waves that rise and fall on the surface of the ocean. They are the ocean. There are, there are no ocean waves apart from the ocean. There is no ocean outside of or apart from the waves. It is just like that. So if you're out on the beach and you see the water, you see the ocean, and you see the waves coming up, oh, here comes a wave. 
and then it goes back down into the water. What was the wave? The wave was the ocean. The wave was the water. What is the ocean before the waves come up? It is the water. It is the ocean. The waves and the ocean are the same thing. Thoughts and the mind are the same thing. So we begin to recognize that and we let that go. We just, we don't think about the waves and the ocean. We don't think about them as being different or the same. And the same thing happens with our thought process. We just let it go. And then as we let it go, we're able to rest. And then those thoughts just subside on their own. So it's just like that. From the space of clarity and emptiness, thoughts arise, but these thoughts are indivisible with the clarity emptiness. When you look into the essence of a thought, there is nothing to apprehend. Where is the thought located? The thought itself is non-conceptual. This makes your heart fill with joy and wonder. So when you begin to recognize that thoughts are just fabrications of the mind, they're just they're just toys of the mind. They're, they're tools of the mind. The mind is trying to figure out what all this stuff is all the time. It's trying to find its place. The ego is trying to find its place, its identity in all that. But if you can let that go, now you can just be free. Now you can just rest and you can experience your true nature. And the joy and the wonder that is in that. It's like removing a veil from your eyes. It is seeing things that you've always seen, but now in naked awareness and clarity that you've never seen before. A negative thought does not need to be rejected or rid from your mind. You need not try to find some wisdom to counteract the negative thought. Whatever is holding you down, if you realize this extraordinary path in which simply recognizing whatever arises enables it to naturally release on its own, then you will become a Buddha in one lifetime. So all this dualistic nature you see is actually part of the manifestation of Buddha nature. All this nature that we see is part of the Buddha nature. And we can see it as all part of the same thing. We can recognize it as the same thing. There's no distinction there. And we become free in that. Now, that's a, a very subtle awareness to be able to do that. And we can think about that. We can ponder that. We can contemplate what that paragraph means, what, this, what that means. And we think about it over and over again. But until we really experience it through our meditation, then it just becomes a vicarious experience of something that I read that, that somebody wrote down and I'm trying to understand. But there is a, there is a personal, spontaneous presence of recognizing that. And that's what we're working for. We're all Buddha. We all see this as a Buddha field. All the dualistic nature is our Buddha field. And we welcome it as the Buddha field. If strong desire emotion arises, you do not follow after it or get lost in it. Instead, look directly into the essence of that desire and rest your mind there without wavering. When desire arises, it is rootless and groundless. This is known as not ejecting desire, but rather as desire purified into its own nature, desire liberated in its own ground. That itself is discriminating wisdom. That itself is Buddha Amitabha. So we talk about the five Buddha families, and there's five wisdoms that are in the five Buddha families. And Buddha Amitabha represents the wisdom of discriminating awareness, of being able to see all this as all Buddha nature and being able to process that. So if you're hearing this for the first time, it may seem very contradictory. 
to everything else that you thought about Buddhism. Or maybe you've heard this a few times now, and it's still contradictory to other things because of its subtlety, but it's also of its, of its beauty, of its elegance. That the Buddha, is, the Buddha field, the, all this is, there's no distinction between positive and negative. There's no distinction between dualism. It's all true. It's our true nature. And being able to recognize that without being threatened by that, by not having fear with that, by seeing, by, by recognizing your identity as being something much greater, much more subtle than, than what your name is, what you look like in the mirror, who you are in regard to your family and friends and your job and things like that. So, yes. Please, is this the same with the practice of pure view, or is there a difference between the two? Oh, it's the same. You... Yeah, I mean, pure view. You know, you can, you know, you can break it down in many things, but this is the epitome of pure view. All right. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Hi, Lance. Yes. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Oh, sorry, I joined late. Um, this is wonderful. Um, I was just thinking, is the Yenam practice, um, would that be the purification of self? So seeing, um, that would be uh, seeing self as selfless. And then pure view is the practice of seeing all phenomena as selfless. Is, is, that, is that accurate or... Well, the, the seeing phenomena as selfless is the work of the generation stage of the um, of the of the environment. The environment, okay. You know, but the so, selflessness of the self—that's the work of the deity. The deity, and so when you so that would be like the the mandala arising in the yidam practice. Is is that right? When you said that? Correct. The environment. Mandala. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good questions. So now back on page three. In the same way, at the arising of the five emotional poisons, a slightly more elaborate enumeration of destructive mental states. The five poisons are desire, aversion, ignorance, pride, and jealousy. Do not follow after or indulge in them, but look into their essence and rest there. By doing so, the emotions and thoughts are pure in their own ground are naturally free in their own nature. They arise, but they are rootless. They are the five wisdoms. They are the five Buddhas. So here the five Buddhas are identified as the heads of the five Buddha families. They are Varanchana, the Buddha family, all pervading wisdom. Ascobia, the Vajra family, mirror-like wisdom. Ratnasambhava, the Ratna family, the wisdom of equanimity. Amitabha, the Padma family, the wisdom of discriminating awareness, and Amagoga City, the Karma family, all accomplishing wisdom. So what this means to us, these are symbolic of these wisdoms. The wisdoms are the permutations of this true nature. This true nature is non-conceptual, is, is whole unto itself. You know, it's non-conceptual. So if I call it one, that's false. If I call it the sum of all, that's false. It's, it's, it's something beyond our human comprehension, although we experience it and we have no real word for it. However, because it's an experience. However, we find that it's, it's like a diamond. And the diamond has, is built up of, of, of you know, elements within the diamond that are bodhicitta, the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. But the way in which that bodhicitta actualizes are the enlightened activities of the different Buddhas. So the way in which they are actualizing is through these wisdoms, through these five wisdoms. 
So understanding these five wisdoms is the way in which this true nature that is indescribable is manifesting in our human realm in our human nature and being able to under to be able to put our arms around it this is the sambhogagaya this is the subtle enjoyment body so we call it the subtle enjoyment body because it is very subtle but we enjoy it very much you know when we get into this and we start learning about this and we start experiencing this it becomes very very blissful it is the essence of bliss it is perfectly natural and we begin to see things in this new clear light, this, this wisdom. So this is the five Buddha families. These are the five wind, wisdoms and so on. And these are the product of looking at our root poisons, looking at the emotions and being able to analyze the emotions and being able to neutralize the emotions with these wisdoms. So we have to thank the emotions. We have to thank the poison because it's through them we're, that we're able to recognize these wisdoms. If we were born as a god, we're beyond that. You know, that's the problem with being born as a god, is that you're beyond those kinds of awarenesses. You know, you're just in this lap of luxury. You're just in this, this perfect pleasure all the time. And you're not thinking about what the component parts are, although the component parts are all there. But you're just oblivious because you're in such a temporary bliss that you're um, you're you're, uh, you're you're blocked from from understanding true nature itself. So here, as a human being, the human being has the ability to recognize this. This is the this is the glory of being a human being. This is the joy of being a human being. So each one of these paragraphs here are full of, of, of great stuff, great, great visualization, great analogy symbolism. So getting to know this chapter like the other chapters is very important. So whatever thoughts or emotions arise, look directly into their essence and rest there. When you do this, the thoughts or emotions naturally self-release where they have no intrinsic realness. This practice is from the oral instruction for taking the five poisons onto the path. This practice should be understood and sustained. So we've talked a fair amount about this, and we're gonna talk about it more in Buddhism 101 again. So anybody who wants to go through the fundamentals again, we're gonna start talking about the fundamentals. And the reason why we keep repeating these over and over again is because we tend to forget, we, we begin to take for granted, we begin to, um, uh, we weren't paying attention the first few times we heard it, and so we need to be uh, refreshed with it. So all these things, and these things, this is part of the tradition of being in the Buddhist tradition, is these teachings are repeated over and over and over again. So. So during the course of a year, you may go through these teachings probably two or three times. There are some teachings you go through once a year. Some you may go through once every four years or eight years. But there's this cycle of teachings that continues and so on. So don't think that just because you heard these things one time or two times or three times, go, oh, now I got it. No, you should thank the opportunity that you have to be part of this and to embrace it and to um, and to look at it in a way that maybe there's something that you are going to awaken within yourself but there's another point and that is that you are supporting these teachings for those who are new to the teaching and when they recognize that here are advanced practitioners who are sitting in these basic fundamental classes and having these conversations with this basic philosophy, it gives them real motivation to be part of this themselves. So you do it not just for yourself, you do it for the benefit of other beings who are in your midst. You are an ambassador of the Dharma. And we do not want to show any kind of conceit or arrogance that we are now superior and above the fundamental teachings. 
the fundamental teachings are the most important teaching. Without those fundamentals being absolutely perfectly um, uh, stable, then at some point those teachings are going to give way and it's like a, a, a house made of cards or a sand castle that gives way. So if you've ever been practicing for a long time, but you didn't have strong, uh, strong fundamentals, and then something happened, changed in your life, and you found that, wow, all my practice was just gone. All the benefits were gone. I got to start over again. But if you've got strong, strong fundamentals, it's very easy to reconstruct and get back to where you were when those vicissitudes happened in your life and things changed. So we need to look directly into all of this. We don't shy away from anything. We look in, we don't suppress things. We, we may put things off to a side for a time. We may be able to, and this is the wisdom of discriminating awareness, is some things need to be put on the side because they're not important right now. I can deal, I, I have more important things to deal with. So I can put these aside. And I write down a note and say, okay, I'll come back to that later. But then there's things here that I really need to be paying attention to. These subtle things I need to be working on now. This is the wisdom of discriminating awareness. What it is I'm going to do. Why am I going to do it? And then how am I going to do it? To introduce appearances as Dharmakaya, just let your mind rest in its natural state without fixation. Let devotion for your Lama well up inside of you. Abide in the non-conceptual state without letting your mind wander off. When you meditate this way over a long period of time, abiding in the, in the original, ongoing nature of mind, whatever appears is not like an external thing outside of the mind nor is it like an appearance in someone else's mind. So what this is saying is that all this is within ourselves. All this, our mind, and our mind is all this fabricated stuff. And the mind is all part of the phenomenal nature. And we need to be able to see it as phenomenal, this mind. But there is this mind of the Buddha that is beyond that, that, is, that subsumes all this. This subsumes all this. This is part of that. And we begin to recognize that. We begin to see that. So it says, over a long period of time, abiding in the original ongoing nature of mind, and the original ongoing nature of mind, the mind that we are born with when we're, when we're infants, Whatever appears is not like an external thing outside of the mind, nor is it like an appearance in someone else's mind. When you're seeing things for the first time as, a, as an infant, what, what, what do you think is happening inside of that, that, that awareness, in that brain? You know, contemplate that. Think about that. Think about what it was when you were like that. Let yourself go back to just being born. Let yourself going back to the womb. Let yourself going back to, to being conceived. Let yourself go forward to dying. Let, let yourself go forward, go present to where you are now. Consider all these things. And see all these things is all temporary. All this is temporary. We've been, we've been born many, many times. We've died many, many times. We've had many, many lives. Not as who you think you are now, but just as the human condition, as parts of nature. You've been a tree before. You've been a rock before. You've been an insect before. You've been different animals before. You've been fish in the ocean. You've been bacteria in the air. All these things, we've been all that. It's all part of the continuum. To be able to recognize that, to be able to realize that, to be able to invite that into our scope of consciousness.
Appearances arise ever clearly as inseparable with the mind. Appearances arise ever clearly as inseparable with the mind. All these appearances, what I was just saying, all these are inseparable from the mind. This is the play of the mind. The natural radiance of mind's nature appears in this unceasing play. This unceasing play, this film, this story that is going on and on and on and on. The names change, the faces change, but the characters remain the same. It's like this play that goes on and on. The more you study history and the more you apply it to the present, you see that it's the same thing over and over again. And then you apply it to the future and you say, you know what? It's just going to continue on and on and on. However, we can, we can improve. We can become happier. We can become more stable. We can understand better and we can release ourselves. Our life here on this planet is a temporary life. When we do not recognize the true nature of these appearances, we grasp at appearances to be real as if they exist inherently from their own side. This way of thinking makes appearances arise to us through diluted perception, thinking that this is permanent, thinking this is real, thinking I am real, thinking I am, I am important, or that I am not worthy of any of this, because we can, we can go to that direction also. The ego will cling on to anything that gives it a uniqueness instead of being able to say, I'm free and I am, I'm not like any of this. I am, I am beyond this. Like that, appearances appear naturally as inseparability of appearances in mind. It is not like appearances in mind were once separate and later merged together. It is in fact the case that appearance in mind have always been inseparable. This is a human condition. Apart from the self-appearing radiance that has always been co-emerent, uh, co let me read that again. Apart from the self-appearing radiance that has always been co-emergent, there is not an atom's worth of true existence to anything in the external world. When all sorts of different appearances arise to your perceptions, know that they are the original ongoing display of self-appearance, primordially inseparable with mind, primordially beyond the limits of arising, ceasing, and remaining. So it's this continuum, this self-arising, And the only way to be able to recognize that is to be able to transcend it. It's like the difference of being in the woods, being in a forest, and thinking this is where it is. it's like this everywhere. But if you could get into a, a plane, or you get into a ladder, or you get up to the treetops, and you look down, now you see the boundaries of the forest and you see that there's a lake over there and you see that there's an ocean over there and you see that there's a village over there or another forest or something. And you begin to see that what you thought was the entirety of your existence now is just an appearance of something that now is much greater than, than what you thought it was. So we need to be able to transcend. We need to be able to go beyond our everyday thoughts, our everyday mindfulness. What we do when we experience that, we bring it back. Now we're forever, now we're changed. Now we bring back that experience and we still may be in the forest, but now we have the benefit of that experience of knowing the transcendence 
of the boundaries of this forest and what's on the other side and so on. And we bring that back and now we begin to incorporate that into our life and we make our life better because of it, not in spite of it. So we sustain the experience in post-meditation. This is coming back. Now we've had this transcendent experience. Now we come into post-meditation, after meditation. So now we let the disillusionment for samsara be the leg of your meditation practice. We wear the badge of impermanence and awareness of death in your, on your heart. You toss far away your attachment to this presence life agenda. Let devotion be at the foremost, forefront of your meditation practice. So these are phrases, these are key points of how it is that we assimilate this transcendent experience into our everyday lives. There's not enough time for us tonight to go into the detail of all this, to, to tell different stories about this, but this is contemplation this is material for contemplation this is something for you to experience this is a meditation you could sit and you can ponder each one of these thoughts for 10 15 20 minutes if you want and start thinking going through the play of what all this is experiencing that give rise to devotion to your lama seeing as him or her as an actual buddha in person this is very important because we have to see that we are part of a society, that we are part of a group of people that are helping each other. And we have to request help and we have to answer help. To deny that help on either side is a great, great falsity, is a great arrogance on our parts that leads to a great suffering on our parts and to others so we have to be very gracious and grateful to our teachers and we have to be very gracious and grateful to our brothers and sisters and our students and to appreciate all of this together to have devotion to this and to see all this as the Buddha in making, the Buddha at work. We are a work in progress to become our true nature, to let our true nature come forth. By It's already there, but it's blocked up. You got to remove all the junk, all the confusion, all the misconceptions, all the mental games that we play and so on. We, and that we look through them, we analyze them and we break them apart. So we pray to your Lama with longing. When meditating, rest in the open, vivid awareness of clarity and emptiness. As you are abiding in this state, whatever subtle or gross thoughts and emotions arise, recognize them. By recognizing them, they will disappear since they have no inherent existence. So what this means is something that seems to be such a conundrum, such a problem, so such a strong force, if we cower to it, if we try and work around it, if we don't meet it head on and try and understand what the cause of that force is, of what that mind is, of what, that, of what those thoughts are, they continue to exist. But when we start analyzing them, we find that they are just compounded of many other things, compounded of, of the emotions, compounded of fears, compounded of, of preconceived ideas, of habitual tendencies, all these things. And it's like splitting them all apart and then it just, it just vaporizes, it just goes away. You say, well, what was I worried about all that time? So when you do this, all sorts of meditative experiences or phenomena will arise, high and low. Sometimes you will experience this clarity emptiness as a sense of vivid clarity and total conviction. 
Other times you will experience a dull, spaced out, dim feeling, and you will wonder what went wrong with your meditation. So sometimes you're very enthusiastic, and sometimes you just, you know, it's like somebody just hit you over the head with a hammer. You know, I can't, I can't deal with it. So we have to recognize that. It's part of the, you know, it's part of the changes that we need to go through. And we need to rec recognize the, the enthusiasm and the exaltation and not let ourselves get carried away with it as an arrogance and thinking that we are supreme beyond other beings. But at the same time, if, if we're having a bad experience, if we're at that dullness, that we don't become despondent and we give up. You know, we can say, okay, today, you know, I'm feeling depressed. Today, I'm not feeling well. There's, there's things going on in my life or, or whatever. I, I have no explanation for it. I just, I just don't feel good. Maybe I didn't get a good night's sleep or so many different things. But to not let that become a, uh, a harbinger of, of negativity and of giving up and of not pursuing your practice. And we may go through periods where it lasts for a while. It may be days, it may be weeks, it may be months, it could be a year. Things happen, you know, an illness comes in your body. And maybe, you know, you gotta have a surgery or something like that, but you don't know it for a while. And in the beginning, you know, you're just not feeling good. And then, you know, a couple months later, you start getting this pain, but you put it aside, say, oh, it'll go away. And then you start taking the over-counter medicine and so on, and it's not going away. And finally, you go to the doctor. The doctor says, well, why didn't you come to me sooner? Now you gotta have, you know, you're gonna have this surgery, but it's gonna make you feel better. So you have the surgery, and then you gotta go through several months of recuperation. So a whole year may go by of being feeling bad, and your practice suffers as a result. But you got to be able to say, okay, I'm coming back to it. I'm going to come back to it. I know how to do it. I've got, I've got the plan. I've got the method here. I've got to reconstruct it again. And it'll do it very, very, very quickly. Lance, may I say something? Sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, what I've been taught in the past is that uh, sometimes this high lows that you have during the meditation process um, I've been taught to recognize those as different patterns of energy flow um, and for example like if, if um, you know you're you're feeling set for example you might be just because you might have a blockage in your pattern of energy and that way, if you recognize it, you just, you know, immediately, like you're saying, you're, you're releasing it. You're, you're becoming aware that you're, you're working through that flow of energy and you're trying to get it right or to get it to, to, to flow just right. And it's the same thing to um, the highs in your meditation when you're feeling very blissful and happy, the same thing. Uh, you have a um, good flow of, of, of energy, um, but not to become necessarily attached to that um, and to continue with your practice and not to expect to have those highs again for your next session of meditation because you might get disappointed and then you all of a sudden drop practice. Um, so well that's correct and you know to look at it as that energy flow is very good you know and you know what causes the energy flow to, to take it a step further you know what are the causes of that you know the energy flow going up or down and so on is something to, to analyze you know to just take it as being, you know, well, I'm having a bad day or something, you know, is one thing. And maybe you can do that for a few days, but when it becomes a prolonged period of time, maybe it needs a little bit more work. And, and, and sometimes you need the objectivity of talking to a brother or a sister, you know, a Dharma brother or a Dharma sister, or to a Lama, to a teacher, something like that, to help you with a little bit more perspective. Sometimes we get caught up in 
in the moments and we lose, you know, we lose the transcendence of being able to rise above the trees of the forest. So, um, so is that part of what you were trying to explain? Yeah, yeah. And I also wanted to ask you, how do some of the lows of the meditation process, like when you're feeling, you know, that you're not doing the, the, the right thing in your meditation, can that be a sign that you're actually on the good path, that you're doing the right thing? Um, Wait a minute, say that again, that, that you're, you're, you're not oh, meditating properly, right. you're, you're not getting the results? Not necessarily that you're getting the, the results. I guess my question is like, sometimes you, you encounter difficulties in, in your meditation process. Um, and I guess it is natural for all of us to interpret those like, I'm not doing something right. But sometimes can that be the opposite thing? And just, can we say that, hey, we're, we're actually experiencing some difficulties here, but, in order to get to the next level, we have to get through this. You have to punch through. Well, I know from my own experience, that's, that's the time to go back and go back to your fundamentals, go back to your notes, go back to your teachings. You know, don't take for granted that you're gonna figure this out by yourself. That's an arrogance. Mm -hmm. That's a pridefulness. That I don't need help. I don't need the support of the system that I've been taught because we go off on on tangents sometimes, and then we begin to rationalize the tangents as being, oh, this is my good way. You know, and that, that's a, that's a, as they say, a slippery slope. And, you know, we, uh, there, there's something called the four reliances. You know, when we, we rely on the, the teachings, but not the teacher. You know, we rely on the meaning and not just the words have it all down in my mind right this second but these reliances and in other words so it's not to trust ourselves that much you know and when we are having these downsides or we're getting too exalted then it's time to take a look at what we're doing because you can get very conceited very fast just like you can get very depressed very fast so you got to be very careful with that and again, this is why we go over these fundamentals over and over again, because it reminds us over and over again. The Eightfold Path. You know, the Eightfold Path is, is a key to, you know, it's the, the first teaching of the Wheel of Dharma, the, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path will keep us on the path, keep our wheels on the track. And when we start thinking we know everything, that's trouble. <laughs> okay anybody else got any questions anybody need a break anybody want to stand up and stretch or anything yeah you do I do let's take a couple of minutes I guess all right just a couple minutes please all right I'm going to stand up and stretch my legs ay 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 Okay, can we get back together again, please?
Waiting for Adrian and Gary. I can see that they have uh, vacated the room. So we see that this completion stage has the element of letting go of of the experience, the meditative experience and so on, of abiding in the Mahamudra. And then it's also, then it's coming back into the body, so to speak. We have ejected from the body. Now we are coming back into the body. So as we come back into the body, we want to be able to um, maintain that awareness, that naked awareness that when we ejected, that we, we didn't lose it, we brought it back with us. So this is the analogy of being born again. Okay. Okay, so we're back on page four here in my notes. And these notes, this comes from the book. I mean, this is directly from the book. It's, uh, I put it in different paragraphs so we can follow it easier. So thoughts, you know, stay the same in here. So it's easier to be able to, to comprehend. So now sometimes all thoughts of emotions and thoughts will birth, burst forth and you will feel like you have this rage boiling inside of you. These are all just the phenomena of meditative experience. Do not get caught up in them. Do not try to either engage in them or push them away. Just sustain your awareness and let whatever arises just arise and will spontaneously without trying to edit it. So this phenomena of meditative experience, so the meditative experience has two parts. In the generation stage, you know, it's all dualistic stuff. We're putting all these appearances, we're, we're bringing all this together. And then in the completion stage, then here is the, 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 the um, ejection from all this dualism. But still, the, the mind is still going and, and thoughts may be jumping out and coming up after that and so on. So we can't allow ourselves to become agitated by those thoughts. We have to have the confidence of what we were doing in the, in the uh, generation stage. So don't try and engage or push them away. Just relax and not try and edit it. So trying to intellectualize this now is, is quite difficult, but it's like trying to drive a car. If you're teaching somebody to drive a car, you can only teach them so much in a classroom or just sitting behind the wheel. But then once you start the car and you start driving, now all those things start happening together and you see the dynamics of how it all works. So we need to have the meditative process in place to be able to bring all these, what seem to be disparate thoughts all together and so on. So we can't deny the practice of meditation itself. It can't be intellectualized. If mind is still, let it be still. If you do not need to apply any effort to rouse your mind into another state, I'm sorry, the phrasing was wrong. If you do not need to apply any effort to arouse your mind into another state, if there is stirring of thoughts, let them stir and simply recognize whatever arises. You do not need to apply any effort to try and still your mind. So true meditation comes effortlessly. After you've gone through all the process of the stages of meditation or the stages of the practice, the method, all the four thoughts that turn to mind, the uh, loving kindness, the compassion, all those steps are very focused and are very active. But then we get to this point, this threshold that we cross over very effortlessly when we go into the true meditation. 
when there is no thought or the thoughts are just coming through and not stopping. When there's no attention being paid to the thoughts, to that maha mudra experience and so forth. That's the meditation. So we call this whole process, we, you know, it's, it's now being referred to as meditation, but it's got these parts to it. But the true meditation is this part where the thoughts are, are not being sought after, not being paid attention to, they're just drifting through if there's thoughts at all. So our mind is still. We are at peace. Our true nature, our naked awareness is actualized. Lance? Yes. Can, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So I, th I think you really cleared something up for me. I just, I just want to make sure I understand. So when we say that our, our mind is still, it's not necessarily that there's no arising or, or thought, so to speak. It's, it's just that, that we're not following the thoughts. Is, that, am I understanding correctly? That's correct. I mean, you, both things can be happening. You can have th periods where there is literally no thought. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize it until a thought comes and you say, oh my goodness, you know, I was, I was just in this no thought. You know, and, and by that time your heart's wide open, you know. Um, but then you can remain in that part and now thoughts start coming, but you're not paying attention to it. Once you open up that door, now thoughts can start coming and you're not paying attention to them. You say, oh, there's another uh, stupid thought. Okay. And, and in some, like I'm thinking about the Chinra Zig Sadhana and the Deity Yoga book, um, it, it talks about a rising. So yeah. is, is, that, is that what it's referring to? I, I, I don't have it with me. I'll, maybe I'll yeah. email you that. Well, I think that, we talked about this. I think we talked about this last time. This arising. Mm -hmm. What's arising is our recognition. Yeah, we did. Yeah. That's what's arising. The, the peace of mind, the pure nature is there. It's always been there. It's never left. But what's arising is our recognition of that and what it is that's been blocking it. That's what's arising. So it may be translated in some of the texts that, that these deities are arising or, or these thoughts are arising, these wisdoms are arising. You know, it's more that our, our, our recognition of them is arising. They've been there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. They, so the recognition arises and then everything else can come and go as it pleases it doesn't really matter right right and and both so if you're in a, if you're meditating and there are no thoughts and you're meditating well let's say <laughs> not at my level but let's say like highly highly realized meditators um mahamudra is is both no thoughts and and it could be thoughts as long as that awareness is there is, is that right I think I'm trying to grasp at something I haven't. I don't really have experience of. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, 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 that is true. You know, and when you're truly in the Mahamudra, then it's it's perfectly stable, and then the, it's it's un it's unperturbed by any thoughts that come. You know, whether it's an external thought, somebody comes to you and, and starts talking to you, or it's a thought that comes up in your in your own mind and say, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that, you still can be remaining in Mahamudra. Okay, thank you. That, that really helps a lot. Hey, Lance. Yes. Um, sorry, can, can you explain again uh, the Mahamudra, the Great Seal? Um, what was it again that, that it seals is it the great seal of emptiness, the male and female energy, or is that? Well, it's, it's beyond the dualism. It's beyond the dualism. And it's, so it's the seal of the mind that has, you know, the seal, the emblem. Mm -hmm. You know, in this, from that point of view, from this, in that context, it is the seal, the, the, the seal of the stamp that is the, um, the saying, oh, you have attained this awareness. This is stable within you. This is what it represents. You know, and that it's come from this commitment. 
you know, it's this mind, and here is the seal that symbolizes that mind. So it's really that simple. It doesn't, it, the Mahamudra itself, the word Mahamudra doesn't necessarily, to me, doesn't connote the essence of what the Mahamudra is. You know, in Dzogchen, Dzogchen is the great perfection. And in that way, Dzogchen, I think, is a little clearer in describing what it is. It's the great perfection. In the Mahamudra, to say it's the great seal, it's the great commitment, doesn't speak to that great perfection as the Dzogchen does. So maybe I'm missing something, you know, because I have limited, you know, education in this and so on. So, but that's, that's how I, that's how I've come to think about it. However, the Mahamudra and the Dzogchen is speaking to both the same mind or the same the same awareness, the same naked awareness is is being described in either the Zoltran tradition or the Mahamudra tradition. Both are the same. That, I, that I'm, I'm clear about. Okay. Okay. Good questions. Um, let me see. Where were we? Still your mind. If you find yourself sinking into dullness or lethargy, rouse your awareness and focus while supplicating the Lama and continue meditating. Your lethargy will then naturally be released. If you find your mind getting too overactive and stimulated, do the same thing as before and continue meditating. The overstimulation. will become stuff we were talking about shamatha meditation you know about our attention sinking and going up by the time we get to this completion stage it's it's a little more stable but uh, it certainly can occur as Kempo is is, is, uh, is mentioning here so like this whatever appearances or phenomena arise catalyze the experience of happiness and suffering if you can apprehend them Within the space of mindful awareness, they will naturally be purified, naturally be released. So what this is saying, happiness and suffering being catalyzed, coming together, fusing together, you know, and seeing them as, as part of the, the human nature, part of the Buddha field, as being experienced by, by human. Now, as a Buddha, as one who has realized one is not affected by these. They can see the affectations, the suffering and the happiness of others. But as the Buddha, the Buddha is not affected by it. The Buddha, the Buddha is transcendent. So that's an important distinction. That's something always to remember, that the Buddha is transcendent. It sees suffering, it sees karma cause and effect, but it has none of the emotion. It has none of the pridefulness. It has none of the, the wisdom obscuration of being identified with any of this. There is no identification. The Buddha does not recognize itself, does not see itself. The Buddha does not need to see itself. The Buddha is within us. The Buddha is not some supreme being. This Buddha nature we talk is the awakened one. And this awakened, this Buddha that is within ourselves is when we have no identity. We're beyond that. Then we have reached Buddha. And we do it in glimpses. We got to see the seeking. We got to see the practicality of all of this. 
It's not some kind of a magical thing that all of a sudden, you know, all this stuff begins to happen. It happens in little, you know, increments, little pieces and so on. And more and more it comes together, more stable it becomes. Uh, Lance, can I ask a question? Of course. I'm, I'm having trouble with, uh, with the thoughts coming up and letting them go. I don't have any problems with that. Just letting them go, watching them like watching a movie. But now when we're talking about apprehending appearances and phenomena, apprehending them, and, and which is synonymous with capturing them within the mind, within awareness, you're not letting it go. You're actually dealing with it somehow. I, that's a different to the concept. point that it neutralizes. You get that? No, I, I don't under first. I don't understand how to how to capture it. Well, you capture it by looking into it, and then you neutralize it with the with the wisdom, with the compassion, you know, whatever that situation. And and this is getting into more of the minutia of the meditation process. So you know, by doing it, by actually engaging in the practice, you'll be able to learn what that is. But it's it's neutralizing it with its with its own self with its own wisdom. If you have hatred, hatred is neutralized by recognizing hatred. It's not recognizing by it's not neutralized by recognizing love. It's by recognizing hatred. And what results is love. Oh, okay, so it's more of a refined view of of, of something. Yes, so, so what we need to do, the next thing that we're going to be engaging in, in Buddhism 201, is going to be more practice. So you're going to have more opportunity to do these practices. And then I think you're going to start seeing breakthroughs, experiencing breakthroughs, where we've had intellectual ceilings, and we haven't been able to break through those intellectual ceilings, because what's on the other side is this transcendence. And we keep on holding on to all these thoughts of what we think it should be. But until we can break that apart, we can't get to the other side. So we keep on asking, you know, the same, you know, we still, we, we're not having these breakthroughs. We keep trying to rephrase the question, hoping that it's going to give us the answer when the answer is the experience of doing it. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So my, my analogy of driving a car, you know, being taught to drive a car, you can't teach anybody, you know, what it's like to be driving a car at 60 miles an hour until they get in the car and start driving at 60 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we got to start doing is start meditating at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I take yeah. it kind of slow. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, so now in these italics on page five, whatever of phenomena arise to the six sense doors, self arisen, they subside naturally, so let them be. When apprehended within the space of suchness itself, the three or five poisons cannot harm you. If they are not apprehended within the space of suchness, even if you engage in all aspects of the path, you will achieve temporary states of higher rebirth. But how will you ever attain the sublime state? Emotions are liberated by knowing this. So this is exactly what I was just talking about. We have to enter into the process. We have to do it. And we have to allow ourselves to fail because we invariably will, but only to resurrect ourselves, to reconstruct, and to be able to slough off the impurities, the defilements, the confusions, the imperfections, to purify them. And then when we come to the opportunity of the mindfulness of, of the naked awareness, 
there's nothing there to stop us anymore because we purified ourselves as we were approaching it. Like I said, the meditation becomes effortless. When it's ready, when we are right, when we are pure, we just become that. There's no saying, oh, I got to fix this before I go in. You will have already done that. Okay. So as expressed above, once certainty has dawned from within you, you have brought your meditation practice to, it, to its consummation. You will actualize realization and awaken to the Buddhahood. Illustrious Milarepa said, because the two obscurations and two aspects of self-grasping are cleared away, sang. Because the self-knowing, self-illuminating wisdom awareness unfurls, gay. When people ask, this is how I define Sangye Buddha. So Buddha in Tibetan is the word Sangye, or the two words Sangye. Buddha in, is a Sanskrit word that means the awakened one. So here in Buddhism, they say it, it or rather in, in Tibetan rather, it means the two obscurations and the two aspects of self-grasping are cleared away. And that's called sang, that now you've cleared away those, those obscurations, the obscurations of, of emotions and, 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 um, and the obscuration of uh, omniscience, of wisdom awareness. You've cleared those away. And the two aspects of self-grasping, of grasping at the self and grasping at phenomena are now cleared away. And now that's called sang. And then, because of the self-knowing, self-illuminating wisdom awareness unfurls, this is called the gay. This is the, the, the deity pride. This is the realization of the freedom. But, but not even, not realizing it as freedom. Not the, realizing it in a, in a, um, in a non-conceptual way. But when we bring it back, we call it gay, sang gay. Remember the Buddha, the story of the Buddha, when he attained enlightenment underneath the tree. And then for seven weeks, 49 days, he paced about, he walked, he, he didn't talk, he didn't teach. He had no words to be able to explain what his experience was. But slowly, slowly, he began to put together the system that he could articulate of not saying what the enlightenment is. He never taught what the enlightenment is. What he taught was how to get there, how he got there. That's what the Dharma is, is understanding all the things that kept him from the enlightenment and then how he overcame the, uh, excuse me, what, what blocked him from the enlightenment and then how he overcame the blockages, and then how he attained that liberation. So that's Sangye. So we are all, we all have Sangye potential within ourselves. We are all Buddha within ourselves. So that is the completion stage. That's it. You know? But it's, it's, it's so simple. But at the same time, what it takes to get there is so, so much work. So it's the, it's the iceberg in the ocean. All you see is what's above the surface of the ocean. You don't see all that is below the surface. And so on all the work that was going to it. But just think, comprehend, imagine all the lives that you have had, that we've all had together to be able to get to this point, to be able to hear these words, to be able to process this stages of meditation. Think of all that that has been done as all that that is below the surface for you to be able to get to this point. There is still more work that has to be done. 
but now you are you are formulating the questions much greater you're examining the what you're examining the why and you're examining the how and you have lifetimes in front of you to be able to do that not just as whatever your name is that's lost but but just the sentient beings all sentient beings we are part of sentient beings they are part of us if we hold on to ourselves as a as a soul as an individual entity then we're missing the point that's eternalism that's individualism materialism so we need to let that go and this is the process in which to do it so the deity yoga you see the power of the deity yoga these are the exemplars of how to do it because they have done it they have been buddy sattvas they have showed us how to do it and now they are in the sambhoga gaya they are pure yidams indestructible and they will show us how to do it by becoming shen reze by becoming manjushri by becoming um samantapadra and all the different bodhisattvas that then lead us to becoming the buddhas so that's why we do the deity yoga so that's what we that's our work now that's that's the next step to start doing that to becoming those deities so this concludes the compilation of systematic instructions on meditation practice consisting of the four thoughts to turn the mind cultivation of loving kindness compassion bodhicitta the bodhisattva conduct of the four immeasurables shamatha and vipassana development and completion stage practice and the view of interdependent origination the view of interdependent origination i gathered to, uh, so kempo is saying here uh this is his conclusion he says i gathered teachings from the fivefold path words of dharmakirti the middle instructions on the meditation stages from gomrem varpa the notes on the development stage by uh Kairam Zindri, the innate arising Mahamudra by Shagjen Lenchig Kajor, and other texts. I pray that the merit of this composition, the two obscurations and habitual patterns, will be purified in all sentient beings. May the illuminating wisdom of the two kinds of omniscience be brought to full bloom. This was written in Garchin Rinpoche's center in Ohio, United States by Kempo Konchok Sandup on March 15, 2014. So the way, so this last point here, this it said the view of interdependent origination. So we talked about that a month or two ago. And so this is the, the stage. This is the, the independent origination of being born going through all the stages of being a sentient being and then then the 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 the, 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 the death and the being reborn again as another sentient being so this play continues it continues on and on until we can liberate ourselves from the play and we become a buddha we have no identity So, any questions, comments? Okay, everybody's speechless. <laughs> Just like enlightenment. <laughs> oh, we're we're blissed out. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Well, good. All right. Well, don't hesitate to read this over and over again. Don't read. Uh, don't hesitate to read the book. These are things that you should read. You know, once a year, once every six months. You know, you should have your reading list. You should have your books that you constantly come back to. You shouldn't read them one time and dismiss them. You come back to them. You know, until this becomes stable in your practice, in your mind, in your life. And this is what your this is your lifestyle, if you choose it to be. You know, you're all young. You all got families, and you got jobs, and you got stuff that you got to do. And I I appreciate that. I've been there too. I know what it is. I'm retired now, so things you know my priorities have shifted a little bit. But it doesn't mean at this time in your life you can't be devoting some time on a regular basis to your studies and your practice. And then when you get to your retirement time, then you can unload. Now you can really get into it. And I was inspired. Maybe I've told you this story before, but you know, when I started learning about, you know, the culture of in the Asian cultures, whether it was in Vietnam or it was in Korea or it was in um, uh, Tibet, um, that what many of the families would do the men and women, you know, they would they would be brought up in, in the in the in the monastery or going to the monasteries and as children they would be learning, you know, the the rules of, of how to behave in a society and so on, and learning some of the basic things about about uh, their traditions, you know, their religious traditions and so on. And then they would, you know, begin to have families and then they would begin to, you know, get to do their work and everything. And they would still, you know, they may put their their spiritual practice, you know, on the side a little bit, you know, but during the holidays, during once a year, three times a year, whatever it is, they would have these ceremonies where they would come together and they would remember and so on and do that. And that was all perfectly natural and very perfectly normal and so on. And they didn't sacrifice their virtue. But then when it finally came time for them to be 50, 60 years old, and now they, their families have grown. They've started families of their own. Their jobs, you know, they, they, they passed on their jobs to younger people and so on. And now it's time for them to engage into their spirituality as their number one priority. Many would go into the monasteries. Many would become monks and nuns. Many of the women would, would stay to help raise the, the grandchildren. And the grandfathers may be nearby. They didn't all go into the, the monasteries. But my point is that when they would reach that time in their life as a senior citizen, if you will, now they would, they would make their, their, their spirituality their, their, uh, their, um, their priority. And they would become teachers and sustainers and the Dharma protectors to the younger generations and so on. So for those of us who have reached that senior point, that's our job. That's what we're doing. For those of you who are in the middle age and middle age of your life and, and who are still with your families and so on, then you need to, you know, take care of business as you're doing, but you also need to pay attention to the elders and to pay attention to the practices and to incorporate them in some type of routine in your life. And then when you reach, you know, the time of your life when you can be a senior, now you'd be much more prepared. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. That's wisdom of 73 years. <laughs> and do it with joy. Be happy. Laugh. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining. So, um, I've gotten behind a little bit. Oh, I know what I, I know what we're going to do next week. Okay, very good. All right. I got to get some paperwork together and I want to mail you. I want you to have these books. And I know many of you continue to use the computer and your phones and so on, but I want you to have these books. These books are, are so important to have in your life. 
And uh, so I want to mail you things. So if I don't have your address, if you don't think I have your address, please mail me your mailing address and I'm going to send you these books that I want you to have that we are going to be using for um, Buddhism one, uh, for Buddhism 201. Okay, so we're going to get into the deity yoga part. And I want you to have these practices so that you can start doing them on your own. Now these, I can't give you empowerments, but I can teach you the introductions and I can teach you the mantras. And then you can do the mantras and so on. And you're going to see that they are going to lead to, to, uh, to happiness and to a great deal of satisfaction. And when you have the opportunity to take the empowerments, you should certainly take those empowerments. Lance, is that the prayer book that you were holding up that you were going to send to us? Well, I can send you this if you don't have this. This is just the daily prayers. No, I, I, I have that. I just okay. didn't want you to send me another one. Right. So if, if you'll send me your mailing address, then I'm going to make a new book that is going to have the, the, uh, the practices in them, the deity Perfect. yoga practices like that. Yes. You so have if, that for me. I, if you don't have it, uh, then send me your address. If you do have it, then don't bother. I won't need but to send you it. You have my email because you send me stuff every week. Well, I'm talking about your mailing your mailing address. I'm gonna oh. Print, I'm going to print. I'm going to have a printed book that I'm going to send to you. It's this okay. book here. Correct. Yes. What? What? Uh, what yep. Adrian is holding up, this book here. So it's a thick book. It's got 150, 162 pages in it. Okay, I'll send it. I, I think you have it, but I'll send it to you again. All right. <clears throat> so Lance, what, what email we use to, what, to communicate with you? Um, uh, 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 ddsc.buddhism101 at gmail.com. Oh. Okay. So if, right. you got, if you got my email, Yesterday and the day that. before, it's it's there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that's the email that I can respond. The 101 email. Okay, the 101 gotcha. email. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, are you ready? Do you want to do 101? Do you want to do these these yoga practices? These daily yoga practices? Yes. Sure. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. No. I, I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Zara, how about you? You into this? Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm enjoying all of this. Yes. Oh, you want to do the deity yoga? Yeah. I'm all right. It. Let me get your address. All right, William okay. and, and Bonnie, are you into this? Yes. Okay. I'm looking for commitment here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right, because it's, <laughs> like, you know, and that's the appreciation. You know, we got to appreciate each other. Yes. You know? It's through the compassion of the teacher that the student receives the teachings. And it's through the gratefulness of the, of the student that the teacher is inspired to, to do these things. So we, didn't take, we can't take each other for granted. My teaching is very small compared to, to that of the lamas. But you know, the, the point of doing this you know, as a lay person and doing it somebody who's had some experience with this and doing this in a language that everybody understands and a context that we all can understand with each other, you know, in our Western civilization way and everything, it, it, it really brings things together, I think. And, and so it makes when we have the opportunity to be in the presence of the, of the lamas, of the great teachers, that it may, it's much more meaningful to us. And we can appreciate them much more. So I think that works. Do you agree with that? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Ed, I know you've been around for a long time. I mean, we've known each other now for a number of years at two different Dharma centers. And, and I think that, you know, these things are, are really, uh, does this make sense to you? Certainly. Okay, good. And if it doesn't, tell me, because I want to know. You know, if you disagree with something or have doubts, tell me. So I don't have any doubts. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. Lance, will you be sending out a notification when Buddhism 101 will be starting on Saturdays? Uh, yes, I certainly will. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it'll be maybe in two weeks. Okay.
So, okay, so we need to do our dedication for tonight. So we go to our prayer book. So thank you for staying with me. I know it's late. So we'll do page 20 and page 21 and 22. So this is the De Korma prayer. So we recite this in English. By the virtues collected in the three times, by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate word of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Tri Kumpa Ratna Shri, who is omniscient, Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, Divine Assembly of Yidams and Assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Dakinis, dwelling in the Ten Directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate word of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a Shravaka or Pratyaka Buddha. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, excuse me, may all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Mars, and, and the hordes of demons. I visual, I, I'm very sorry, I'm, may all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Mars, and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such, and the pervading clarity of Dharmaka. May I, in any case, gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the Varda. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind the Buddha, and all enlightened beings. Om, ah, om. Thank you all very, very much.